And these are some of the values that progressive companies and government agencies that I've worked with in the last several years are embracing. You're not going to encourage people to take risk and to be innovative if you have a management by fear environment. So I think that's one important way to ensure that people, uh, especially leaders, walk their talk. With respect to your second question about the more things change, the more they stay the same, if you look at the last 50 years of business, we have come full circle. We have tried many different uh, techniques and methods to teach people, but I think what Dr. Peter Drucker wrote back in 1951, that the customer is the reason we're all in business, there's a very good example of how the expression works. The more things change, the more they remain the same. We moved away from the customer, and now, 50 years later, as Dr. Peter Drucker suggests, we have come back to the customer as the most important part of any business. Muchas gracias. Continuamos ahora con el módulo 2. We will continue with the second module in which Mr. Hinton will explain the mechanics of some of the leadership strategies you should implement in your organizations in order to achieve world-class success. I can't think of a more exciting topic than the one we're about to discuss, leadership. There's no question that strong, effective leadership will be required so long as businesses and educational institutions desire to be world-class organizations. Dynamic leadership is even more important in the public sector because government and public officials hold the key to economic reform and growth in their cities, states, and nations. As we examine the idea of leadership strategies for world-class organizations today, I want to take you beyond the traditional examination of leadership, that is, the personality and charisma issues that tend to dominate most discussions on what makes a successful leader. And instead, I'd like us to travel to a higher vantage point where we can measure a leader's success on the basis of what he or she has achieved. In other words, let's look at the results. Last year, while researching my new book, Leadership Lessons I Learned on the Golf Links, 72 Ways to Par the Course, I was playing a round of golf in Kansas City with a delightful gentleman by the name of Fred. Fred has been around golf for many years, so he's heard all the excuses and bad jokes. We had just finished playing the first hole on a very challenging golf course. Actually, the first hole on every golf course is challenging for me. But Fred asked me, what was your score on that hole, Tom? And like most golfers, I started to replay the first hole in my mind and recount my shots to Fred. He politely interrupted me and said, I haven't got room for all that on this little scorecard box. Just give me a number I can write down. So I told him, seven. That brief exchange was a pointed reminder that leadership, like golf, is ultimately about results. If you're like me, I'm sure you enjoy filling in all the details as to how you got your score. But in the final analysis, all anybody really needs to know or wants to know is your score, the results. How did you do? And that number on the scorecard really tells the whole story because it's what we are measured on, our performance. One reason why so many of us have difficulty in performing successfully as leaders is because 
Leadership is an art. And by its very definition, any art is difficult to master. Just ask any accomplished musician, artist, or athlete. It is extremely difficult to excel on a consistent basis. This is why few teams repeat as the World Cup soccer champions or Super Bowl champions in football. The standard for success is constantly being raised for leaders in today's highly competitive and changing world. As the biblical expression says so aptly, many are called, but few are chosen. Ironically, however, I believe everybody is a leader. In fact, I believe you and I make decisions every day that help us develop, mature, and grow as individuals. And these same decisions advance our companies, our society, our cities and nations, and ultimately our planet. Furthermore, we are all leaders because each and every one of us meets the definition of a functional leader. A functional leader is someone who has the authority to make decisions and exercises that authority by making decisions and ultimately accepts the consequences of their actions, for better or for worse. That is my definition of a functional leader. For those of you who have read my books or heard me speak in the past, you know I also define leadership in human terms because a successful leader must not only be able to function in terms of making decisions, but he or she must be able to implement those decisions through people. And so the definition of leadership I prefer to use is this one. Leadership is the ability to help individuals and organizations surpass themselves. In other words, leadership is first and foremost about people, but ultimately it's about how we perform and create results. Let me share with you a recent conversation I had with another author that reinforces this point about the functional dimension as well as the human dimension of leadership. Lori Beth Jones, a talented author and speaker who wrote the book, Jesus CEO, spoke with me recently about the subject of leadership. In our conversation, we discussed the key attributes of a successful leader. And we concluded that throughout the ages, the greatest leaders have been those men and women who met the following criteria. First, they knew how to harness and develop human talent. Secondly, their intentions were honorable, ethical, and served the good of all mankind. And thirdly, they achieved extraordinary results. Obviously, Jesus of Nazareth, the subject of Lori Beth Jones' prolific book, more than qualifies as a successful leader by our criteria. I think Mahatma Gandhi and Mother Teresa also meet our criteria. Perhaps Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, and many other well-known leaders would meet our criteria as well. I'm sure you could list hundreds of well-known people in your own countries who also meet this criteria for a successful leader. But my point here is that too many people especially in business and government and education, are seduced into thinking about and evaluating someone's leadership abilities in terms of their charisma or public speaking skills. Certainly those traits are useful to a great leader and can help a leader stir the passions in people. But charisma and public speaking skills are not the stuff great leaders are made of. We only need to look back a few years or decades to such anti-leaders as Hitler or Mussolini to realize that despite their forceful dynamic and even charismatic personalities, their intentions were not honorable and frankly, they failed to achieve 
any long-term results. In fact, they ruined their countries and caused massive pain and suffering for millions of people. I have always respected my colleague and management guru, Dr. Peter Drucker, who has written many outstanding books on the subjects of management and leadership. Let me quote one passage from Dr. Drucker's book, Managing for the Future. In the chapter entitled, The Mystique of the Business Leader, Dr. Drucker writes, the Japanese recognize that there are really only two demands of leadership. One is to realize that rank does not confer privileges. It entails responsibilities. And the second demand is to acknowledge that leaders in every organization need to impose on themselves that congruence between deeds and words, between behavior and professed beliefs and values that we call personal integrity. In other words, Dr. Drucker boils down leadership to these two basic core issues, responsibility and integrity. I would agree with Dr. Drucker that leadership is more about the doing than the flash and charisma. And so what kinds of leadership strategies can I offer today to help you move your organization closer to a world-class level? After all, we all should aspire to be best in class or world-class. I think that is the ultimate measure of how well we've utilized our leadership talents. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, in order to talk about leadership strategies for a world-class organization, we need to focus our attention away from the more glamorous aspect of leadership, that is, personalities and charisma, and instead, let's talk about the mundane, unromantic aspects of leadership because, in the final analysis, the essence of leadership is performance. And the ultimate measure of one's performance is achieving results. So this begs the question, how do leaders get things done? What I've discovered over the past 10 years of studying this fascinating subject is that world-class leaders invoke what I refer to as the five P's to get things done. The five P's are purpose, people, principles, processes, and performance. Let's briefly examine each one of these five Ps. Purpose. The foundation for effective leadership is having a clear sense of purpose and understanding the organization's mission. This is a responsibility only the leader can fulfill by virtue of his or her position. It is incumbent upon the leader to articulate the goals and formulate the priorities for the organization. The leader must also set and maintain the standards of excellence for the organization. In a nutshell, purpose can be summarized as the mission, vision, and goals of your organization. Well, I would encourage every company to involve as many people as possible in compiling their mission, vision, and goals. The impetus for this work must begin and end with the leader. Remember that the number one reason a business fails is a lack of cash flow, but the number two reason a business fails is a lack of planning. It is imperative that you and your senior management team devote large blocks of concentrated time to examining your plan, that is, your purpose, your vision, and goals. Constantly refine them. Hold management retreats twice yearly to review and discuss your plans of action for success. And make these sessions both fun and creative, so the mind is challenged to think beyond the present and project into the future. Once you have a clear sense of purpose, you need the second P, which is people. 
Leaders derive their strength from people because every great leader needs followers and believers. Of course, the most important follower to any leader is you. A leader who does not believe in himself will almost always fail. The importance of people to a leader's success is crucial. We've read many books on the subject of people in the workplace. But let me add just two important thoughts about leaders and their relationship with people. First, a successful leader knows and understands that people are his or her greatest asset. I cannot emphasize enough the unlimited power and potential your company has in its people. Unfortunately, most organizations fail to capitalize on their people power because they have created a culture that operates on a flawed management concept known as command and control. Basically, the command and control management model states, I'm the boss and the boss is always right, so don't challenge me or I'll terminate you. In business, that isn't leadership, that's mismanagement. It's suppression and it causes your people to run and hide. Great leaders do not rule by fear. They use their positional power to encourage ideas and foster creative solutions to nagging problems in their organizations. Great leaders train their people and they empower them to make decisions and yes, even make mistakes. And great leaders always reward their people and praise their work because a successful leader realizes that results come about through hard work and sheer sweat of their followers. I can tell you every one of you without hesitation if you want to increase your results by double digit figures within 90 days implement a leadership strategy that liberates your people to make decisions offer solutions to improve your business and save the day for your customers let me give you two powerful examples from the annals of American business that emphasize the people power factor in 1978, the Chrysler Corporation, which is best known for its automobiles, was on the brink of bankruptcy. The company had a dynamic new president named Lee Iacocca, which they hired. Mr. Iacocca knew the auto industry. He had been president of Ford Motor Company and created several successful models, including the Mustang and the Cougar. By hiring dynamic new leadership and instilling in the Chrysler workforce a sense of pride and commitment, Iacocca was able to save the company and restore it to profitability in three years. In his autobiography, Lee Iacocca says, the secret to Chrysler's success was people. He writes about the cultural change that transformed Chrysler once the shackles were removed and people were allowed to think, to make decisions, and experiment. He even encouraged them to fail in order to stimulate innovative ideas. The second example is equally powerful because it tells us what can happen when you encourage your people to use their brains rather than force them to check their brain at the door as they show up for work. American Airlines wanted to find ways to save money and cut cost. So it instituted an employee suggestion program and encouraged employees to send in creative ideas to help the company make money, save money, or improve productivity. Employees were rewarded for their ideas with various incentives, including cash. In two years, American Airlines had saved enough money from employee suggestions that it purchased a fifty million dollar jet. Does it pay to let your people think, act, and innovate on the job? My answer is a resounding yes. 
The third P represents principles. When I use the term principles, I am referring to the core values for which you stand and by which you operate your company and make decisions. Again, principles is an area that demands a leader's involvement and support. Remember, people will always do as you do rather than do as you say. Let's look at how clearly defined principles and core values can boost your results. Two of the Disney company's core values are fun and cleanliness. This translates to happiness in everything the company does for its guest and cast members or employees. It also translates into the cleanest theme parks in the world. Rarely will you see trash on the grounds at Disney's theme parks. Why not? Simple. It violates one of their core principles, cleanliness. If your company operates without a clearly defined set of principles and core values, abuses will occur and the boundaries of acceptable standards will be stretched. In the final analysis, your organization will lose money, employees, and customers. It's imperative that your employees, suppliers, and customers know what your company stands for. If, for example, one of your core values is low prices, but your competition undercuts you, you're in trouble. If one of your core values is honesty, and your salespeople lie to your customers by promising to install a vital piece of equipment by June 15th, and they have no intention of honoring that promise, you're in trouble. If you drift away from your core values and principles, you will also be out of business because you have no conscience by which your people can distinguish right from wrong. You are, as we'd say in the consulting business, out of integrity. The fourth P in my formula represents processes. What I mean by processes is this. Who does what? How do they do it? And what's the result? Another term for processes is standards. While processes deal with how the work is done, standards play an important part because the end product must meet the expectations and specifications of your customers. So, a successful leader must focus on the how in order to ensure the end product works for the customer. When the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded shortly after its launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, 10 years ago, it killed the entire crew. It was discovered that the infamous O-rings were flawed. Further study revealed that several employees had brought the design flaw to the attention of management. But the problem was ignored because of rigid deadlines the company had to meet on its contract. Basically, the company failed to correct a flawed process and seven people were killed as a result of their arrogance and stupidity. The lesson here is simple. Pay attention to how you produce your products and services. If there is a way to do it faster, better, cheaper, and still meet or exceed the customer's expectations, then do it. Ask your employees for their ideas and watch the process improve and costs go down. The last of the five Ps is performance. This is the bottom line. Everything we do by way of leadership is to enhance our performance and bottom line results. This is what our stockholders and voters judge us on, our performance. The secret to a satisfactory performance is to know in advance what is expected of you. Because once the game has begun, it's unfair to change the rules or the goals on the player. One last thought on performance. A leader's job is to ensure that his or her people succeed on the job. 
The way you set your people up for success requires four steps. First, explain in very plain language what you expect your people to do. Secondly, show them how to do it. Thirdly, measure their performance. And finally, the fourth step, either praise their efforts or redirect them towards the finish line so that they can succeed. Too often I find most managers and leaders fail because they short circuit one or more of these essential steps. In effect, we abandon our people and they never know how they are doing on a job until someone comes along and bangs them on the head for making a mistake. So follow these four simple steps and make sure you, as a manager, are providing the support necessary to ensure your people succeed. Let me close with a brief story about leaders and your legacy. We all aspire to be remembered for something good, for some contribution or deed we perform during this life. And I think my story reiterates this point. In 1947, a young British reporter was traveling in India. His goal was to interview Mahatma Gandhi, the great spiritual leader of India. The reporter finally reached Gandhi just as he had boarded a train and taken his seat by the open window. Seeing Gandhi sitting there, the reporter began to run alongside of the train as it slowly pulled away from the station. He finally reached Gandhi's window and he called up to him saying, Mahatma Gandhi, I'm a reporter, a newspaper reporter from Great Britain. Do you have a message I can take back to the people of England? Now, unbeknown to the reporter, Gandhi had been fasting that day. As part of his fast, he did not speak, but he did communicate. Not wanting to disappoint the young journalist, Gandhi picked up a blank sheet of paper and scrawled a few words on it. He then held up to the open window for the reporter to read. And it said, my life is my message. As we conclude this program today, I want you to remember that your life is your message. How you coach your people is your message. How you clearly defined your purpose and the principles you choose to live by is your message. The processes you operate by to meet or exceed your customers' expectations is your message. Your level of performance is your message. And ultimately, as Gandhi reminded us, your message becomes your legacy. It is my sincere hope for each and every one of you joining us here today that your legacy will be one of greatness and success as a leader for you, your company, and everyone you touch through your words and actions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hinton. Let us now begin with our second question and answer session. We remind you that it's one question per phone call. We're receiving a fax from Brazil, Brazil, which states or asks, to what extent can your concepts on coaching be applied to continuous education? Well, Armando, I think that uh, coaching and continuous education are synonymous. In other words, there's an old expression that says that the school is never out for the pro. And basically what that translates into is that if you're going to be successful in any business, you have to continuously learn. You have to